Okay, so we talked about stream ciphers. Now let's look at the uh, types of stream ciphers we have. So stream ciphers can be divided into two classes, synchronous stream ciphers, asynchronous stream ciphers. When we call asynchronous, we actually also call them self-synchronizing. So using this word may be more explanatory, right? We, we more understand what this means. So it's, it's a self-synchronizing. So if the synchronization is lost, it somehow, you know, correct this synchronization problem. So let's start with a few definitions. The types of stream ciphers we have considered so far belong to the class of synchronous stream ciphers. To use these ciphers, the sender and the receiver must be synchronized. This means that they must set the state at the same position. They must use the same key. If the synchronization is lost, then the decryption fails. Okay. And synchronization can fail due to many factors like device failures. You know, sometimes your friend drops their mobile phone a lot. So this way you stop, you know, communicating in a proper way. Sometimes there are problems in the communication channel due to weather conditions or due to your position. Maybe you are climbing a mountain or you are going to the other side of the hill. Or there is a, you know, a jammer around. So if there's an active adversary, they can insert ciphertext digits, delay ciphertext digits, or modify ciphertext digits. So this way, also the synchronization is lost. So synchronization can be lost due to many factors. But the thing is that to restore the decryption, additional measures have to be employed, right? You can do reinitialization, placing special markers at regular intervals, or you can try all possible key streams if you lost just a few bits so you can try all of them. But generally, you know, uh, restarting everything, for instance, you know, you call your friend, you hear them, but they don't hear you. You know, you can keep shouting, but you can simply turn off and, you know, call them back again. And this will be reinitialization, right? So most of the time, this is what happens. Yeah, let's talk about active adversaries. So I'm now going to talk about synchronous stream ciphers where there is no self-synchronization, okay? I mean, the communicating parties somehow synchronize themselves. Then let's see what an active adversary can do in this scenario. A modification of a ciphertext digit does not affect the decryption of other digits, no error propagation. If you are simply using a key stream generator, right? If you are simply exhorting the plain text with the plain, sorry, exhorting plain text with the key stream, so, and obtaining the ciphertext. So if the adversary flips a bit in the ciphertext, this only affects a one bit in the plain text, right? So there are no error propagation. As a result, an active adversary who deletes or inserts ciphertext digits can be detected by the decryptor. Because if they insert or delete something, after that point on the decryption fails, okay? This is one way of detecting an active adversary because your synchronization is lost. Because think about it in this way, you have the plain text, you have the key stream, you exert, obtain the cipher text, but they remove one bit. So your cipher text is shifted one bit compared to your key stream. So when you exert the cipher text with the key stream, plain text will be, you know, unintelligible words. So this way you can detect an active adversary. On the other hand, an active adversary may change the selected ciphertext digits knowing the exact results of those changes on the plain text. So if you don't have any authentication mechanism, like we have seen in the authenticated encryption, then active adversary actually can modify your messages, but they may still be meaningful in this way. Without knowing the secret key, they may you know, change the messages that you are sending. Thus, some additional mechanisms must be employed in order to provide data origin authentication and data integrity guarantees. This is why we talk about authenticated encryption and message authentication codes and so on. Let's move on to asynchronous stream ciphers now. When the key stream is generated as a function of the key and the fixed number of ciphertext digits, we obtain a self-synchronizing stream cipher. As you can see, in the previous one, we didn't uh, consider ciphertext digits. Now, I'm determining the state depending on the last few 
uh, bytes or bits of ciphertext. This way, if you start receiving the ciphertext correctly, then your state will be correct. And this way you will recreate the synchronization. So your next state function now also depends on some bits of the uh, ciphertext. And the rest is similar, you know, the key generation function generates it from the current state and so on. Since the decryption function depends on depends only on k fixed ciphertext digits, resynchronization is possible if ciphertext digits are deleted or inserted. So after you start receiving k consecutive correct ciphertext digits, your internal state will be correct. Right? The cost of resynchronization is a loss of a fixed number of plain text digits. When a ciphertext digit is changed, inserted or deleted, the decryption of at most k ciphertext digits may be incorrect, so we have limited error propagation. But again, this doesn't provide any authentication, so we have to have other solutions to provide you know, data integrity or data authentication. So let's compare these two cases, asynchronous versus synchronous. So each plain text digit has an effect on all the remaining ciphertext digits in an asynchronous stream cipher because you are using ciphertext digits in the next state function. This implies that the ciphertext does not inherit the statistical properties of the plain text. As a consequence, asynchronous stream ciphers may be more resistant against attacks based on plain text redundancy. Due to self-synchronization and limited error propagation properties, detection of an active adversary is more difficult than for synchronous stream ciphers, right? Because since it corrects itself, we don't know if there's an attack is going on or not. But in the synchronous cases, you know, the decryption fails and you kind of suspect that there might be an active adversary. The input of the generator uses the ciphertext, thus the adversary has a partial knowledge about the variables being used. I'm talking about asynchronous scenario. As the key stream depends on the message, these generators have limited analyzability. This is the bad thing about asynchronous stream size, because you might say that, okay, if one of them can provide self-synchronization, why would I use the other one, right? Because it has more benefits. But due to these benefits, we have some uh, disadvantages like we cannot detect an active adversary and uh, adversary has some partial information about the input because we are using ciphertext digits to determine the next state. But also, since the key stream we are producing depends on the plain text that we are encrypting, then this gives us limited ability to analyze the design, okay? In the other cases, uh, the key stream production does not depend on the plain text. It only depends on the algorithm. So I can analyze, you know, try to crypt analyze the algorithm and provide uh, some security results easily. Okay. Now let's look at the synchronous stream ciphers. A synchronous stream cipher attempts to capture the spirit of one time pad by using a short key that generates the key stream, which appears to be random. Such a key stream is called pseudo random. As you can see, I'm no longer using the word random because we are simply using a short input and try to provide a long in output that looks random. Much of the work in the field of stream ciphers is deciding what constitutes a pseudo-random sequence. In this context, key stream generator stream ciphers are evaluated by means of the quality of the key stream it produces. So, of course, the meaningful question will be next is that how do we measure the quality of a key stream? It is just zeros and ones, right? So how can I say that this key stream generator produces random looking or quality key stream? So quality of a key stream can be determined like this. A key stream generator stream cipher is as secure as its output is closer to be random. This concept can be understood in two ways. First one is, is there some imbalance to the way the sequence is generated that allows the cryptanalyst to guess the next bit with some probability better than that of random guessing? So this is related with the appearance. This means that, you know, you are looking at the output, it's many zeros and ones, and at point, at point of t it stops and it's going to produce next bit. It will be either zero or one. So if it is a good design, 
guessing if it is zero or one, you should have the probability of, you know, like flipping a coin. If you have more advantages than prob one over two probability, then this means that you have, from the appearance of this key stream, you have more advantage. And second way of looking at it, is it hard to reproduce the sequence? This is related with the inherent complexity of the sequence. So this is another way of looking at the problem. So for instance, look at it in this way. I give you a hundred bits of zeros and ones. So question is, is it really hard to produce this 100 bits? I mean, for example, think about it in this way. What will be the smallest LFSR that will produce this 100 bits? If it is really small, like two bit LFSR, then we will say that it is bad quality. But if it is a 100 bits LFSR that produces that 100 bits, then we will say that its complexity is really large. So let me give you some ideas. For instance, when we talk about the appearance, this was the first way of looking at the problem recall. We will, what we should do is to look at the period. period. So after how many bits it starts repeating itself, and this would be, for our case, should be virtually infinite, you know. After, for instance, two to the one hundred and twenty uh, eight bits, it should repeat itself, for example. Another thing is that when you give me zeros and ones, I should check if it looks random so I can apply statistical tests on them and see if they pass all of these tests, okay? So these two approaches related to appearance, but uh, for the other problem when I said, is it really hard to reproduce that sequence? You can look at linear complexity, max order complexity or lamp positive complexity and so on. So for instance, in the linear complexity, what we are checking is that what is the smallest LFSR that produces that uh, key stream. Okay. So in the max order complex, it's no longer linear and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me finish by just uh, mentioning names of a few steam ciphers, then we will talk about some of them in detail. So in the past, steam ciphers were really faster than block ciphers. I showed you the picture of A51, right? It was something really simple. So think about 1987 when you had a mobile phone, that algorithm was there in the hardware. So it was easy to encrypt and decrypt. You know, putting this or AES there would be more complicated. But nowadays we have lightweight designs. So today in communication, most of the time we moved on to, you know, block ciphers. So if you look at the, some of the stream ciphers, a51, which was a GSM standard, used 2G, used in 2G. RC4, used in our modems at home, you know, wide equivalent privacy. And E0 Bluetooth, as you can see, all of them are related to communication, right? You know, Bluetooth, web, GSM. So this is about data in transit, not data in at rest, right? So since it is about data in transit, you know, you don't have the plain text beforehand, so you should have a fast algorithm so that the communication should be seamless. This is why in the past we used uh, steam ciphers all along here, but nowadays think about 3G, we had we have A53, which is actually actually a block cipher called Kasumi. In web, we moved on the you know WPA or WPA2, and there we no longer use RC4, we are using AES. Again, a block cipher. I think Bluetooth is still E0. So I, I don't know if it has changed. I haven't looked. I mean, for the last five years, I haven't checked. So maybe if there's an, any a new development, I don't know. Okay. So let me also talk about a few steam cipher. So as you can see in the past, we realized that due to AES competition and so on, we have a lot of actually knowledge due to this. We know how to design good block ciphers and how to cryptanalyze them. But academicians real, realize that we are not that uh, proficient in designing or analyzing stream ciphers. So they started a competition called eStream. This started in 2004 and had 34 candidate algorithms, none of them with uh, Turkish designers. 
And seven of them were included in the final portfolio in 2008, but they said that, okay, let me show you the names. For the hardware, they chose three algorithms, Grain version one, Mike, Mickey 2.0 and Trivium. I think Grain received many version updates afterwards. And in software, there were four algorithms like HC128 Rabbit, Salsa, and Sosemon. So although they are included in the final portfolio, the competition design, uh, the organizer said that, you know, we should need more analysis of the ciphers before we uh, standardize them. But years later, Trivium became an ISO standard in 2012. It is still standard. But the problem is that it only supports 8-bit secret key, which is actually really short today. And also Chacha, which is a modified version of Salsa, is now a standard because it's included in TLS 